Wow. Um, so I'm still, still. I mean, it's the th it's the third time, no, fourth fourth time actually. I've seen this, seen Senna, and it's st it still has such an effect on me that so I'm just, <laughs> just trying to collect myself with it. Um, so thank you for coming to the Garden Cinema to discuss um, Senna. Um, the Summer of Sport was a season where we we wanted to collect the the best, well, what we felt to be the best sports do documentaries that that weren't really for people that love sport, for people that that, that love great films, great stories, uh, and this is certainly that. I, I have I, I I don't personally have any interest in Formula One, uh, but this film uh, moves me. Um, so perhaps. Could I start by just asking you how, how this film came to you? And so it's your first documentary film. Um, perhaps you could go from there. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm, uh, yes, yeah, so I've been making quite a few films before I'd made this. I'd made a few features, dramas, so I'd written and directed drama. Um, and that was like what I trained as, was a kind of fiction filmmaker. Um, but I've grown up loving sport and playing sport and watching sport. I just in my family it was like that's what we did right so i play football i like football and um formula one was one of those things that i saw growing up it was on and when i was at college probably it's the kind of center prost area sort of school into college and so it was one of those things the japanese grand prix would be on in the middle of the night on a beep or i'd listen to them on the radio on radio 2 or something back then and so it was always a part of life but i never thought you know i'd go and make anything about sport um but one of the things about sport, one of the reasons I love sports and films about kind of sport is that you can't make it up. I mean, there's something about when people try to do a story, generally for me, kind of fiction films have kind of become unbelievable. And the thing about Senna and his story is, and even when I, you know, I made it and I watch it, I haven't seen it for a long time. You're like, it's unbelievable what happens. Like every beat of his life and his story is so like, if you wrote it, you wouldn't buy it. And so there's something about that that is really powerful with great sport is the, the kind of the, t the tension and the drama. And so so that that's kind of what I was interested in. So, yeah, I came into Senna sideways because someone asked me, would I be interested in doing it? And because they knew I was a fan and they knew me from kind of being interested in football, I said, would you be interested? The honest truth is they asked every other documentary director, I think, in town and everyone passed. Because I think at the time, no one was really interested in making a film about racing driver. I thought, who cares about racing drivers, right? And or they came in and said, you know, we should make a film about, you know, how bad cars are for the planet. And so I was like, okay, that could be interesting. It'd be a detour in my life. And, and we were sort of talking a bit earlier on, we just had our first kid. So I was making my previous film and it hadn't quite come out. And our first son was just born. And the thing about drama is it took me around the world. I'd made films in lots of places around the world, in India, in the North Pole. And I thought, OK, this will be easy. You know, I could make a doc. It could be kind of easy, quick. It was like five years. This took so long to make. So it was like, but it meant I was around more. I was at home while the kids were growing up. And I just had this instinct that there was such a powerful story that I remember watching, but there was something about him and that's really what the film, why the film works. Is Senna is just like an amazing character and so like beautiful and charismatic, but stands for something. And the film is really just about following his path and telling it from his point of view. That was a key thing and on all levels. And the big idea on Senna that, that I had was to not have interviews, to not have talking heads, which now has become pretty common across the board Senna's probably the turning point film which was the first doc which didn't have contemporary interviews on camera and my feeling was always he has to narrate the story and this comes from coming from a drama background where you who's your central character whose point of view are you telling the story from who's your antagonist who's the kind of the enemy in this case Prost right Prost is a great driver four times world champion but in this film the clues in the title we're going to tell the story from Senna's point of view. He's our hero. I want you to all come out feeling like you're Brazilian. And we only ever get in the car with him. We only ever tell what he's feeling. And everyone else is sort of against him. And that was the idea. It was coming from a drama background. I wanted to make a doc entirely out of archive. There's nothing in there that I filmed, which feels like a feature film. That was the idea. Uh, I understand that um, Manish, the writer, um, 
was obviously involved right from the beginning. He and was the one who knew everything about Senna. He yeah. had the photographic memory and research. And I wasn't. I'm, I was like a sport fan, but not a Formula One nut. So I didn't know everything. So it was a really interesting kind of kind of conflict, but also teamwork with someone who knows everything and someone who's like, yeah, but I want to make the film for people who know nothing. So it becomes a, an element of reduction. And people who are really into it, everything's important. And I was like, yeah, no one cares. God, get rid of it. So, you know, it's a Formula One film. It's about Formula One and it's authentic, but we never talk about engines, really. We don't talk about tyres. There's all this stuff that, if you're into it, is really important. And we're like, I want to simplify it. We started off with Manish's kind of first draft actually had all of the great drivers at the time. So, you know, there was Mansell in there and uh, um, there was kind of PK was in there. There were like lots of world champions. And one of the things that happened as we worked together was how do we simplify it to feels like a boxing match? So it's about him and Prost. And how do you simplify it so anyone who watches it can go kind of red car good, blue car bad. You know, it's a, let's simplify it to the bare essentials, which is what we do. Black car, really cool. You know, that's it. You don't care about like logos and who the sponsors are and, you know, which tyre company and Honda did this and so and so. I'm like, no one gives a shit. They do, but not in the movie. Not We've got to reduce it to the bare essentials of two people. One who wants to win by going as fast as possible, who believes in God. And one who wants to win by going as slow as possible, who doesn't believe in anything apart from winning and therefore is quite political. That's what we were playing with, really. Manish was a key part of that team, definitely. I, I imagine, so obviously working with archive footage as you do, um, how does that process work in terms of scouring for footage? I understand you, you got some footage from Senna's family is that yeah so there's lots of personal stuff in the film is from the family and they'd never given lots of people had contacted the family previously to try to make a film and and they hadn't approved the filmmakers or you know there were lots of reasons why it didn't happen so Manish who's the writer and James who was the producer had worked tried to find lots of different directors and tried to set it up for quite a while and and I'm not joking when I say they were like I was like the last person I could think of. I'm like, what about you? And I'm like, yeah, I quite like that. Um, and so yeah, there was family footage. It's also you know this is funny. It's kind of it was a period film when we make it, but it's funny watching it now. The way the cars look, the way technology changes, the way the cameras are changing within the cars. You know how exposed the drivers are um, in those days, and also you know. Bernie Eccleston is like a key. We had to get footage from Bernie. We had to negotiate a deal with Bernie Eccleston. Imagine that. So, so I mean, there's a really important detail. When I started on this film, it was set up in a slightly more um, conventional way in terms of, I think there was like 30 minutes of Formula One archive, 30 minutes of interviews, maybe sort of 10 minutes of news footage. It was kind of split up. That's how it was budgeted. And then we started looking at the material and, you know, once we started looking, because Formula One exists for sponsorship makes how they make the money, right? You make money by having sponsors all over the cars, all over your costumes, your kind of your, your kit and your helmet and everything. Much more now, but at the time, you know, it was a sport that existed through sponsorship. How do you get the sponsors happy? You have cameras everywhere. You film it. You show it around the world on television. So because of that, there's all this material. And that's where Senna was like a pivotal moment in documentary filmmaking in a way. Because Formula One had all this footage but didn't know it was worth anything. Off, after this film, everyone, whoever you are, whichever, whichever kind of sport or famous athlete, whatever, realised, oh, that archive is probably worth more than the talent driving a car because we can then sell that and we can do something with it. And Bernie had never licensed any material to anyone. And you might get it in like a, a, a cigarette commercial or something, right, where they charge a hell of a lot of money to use a few seconds of Formula One footage. And, and we were able to get access to like where his archive used to be in Biggin Hill and went through all these tapes that no one had been through and said, like, this is unbelievable, there's so much stuff. My gut instinct from quite early was, I think we could do the whole film entirely out of archive, where we just stay in the moment. And this is the key thing that I try to do with my docs, is tell them in the present. So if I had interviewed someone, you'd see Alan Prost on camera talking about Senna in the past tense, and you'd go, if you didn't know anything about Fallen Money, you'd go, all right, see, so what's happened to him? So he's obviously not there. And then you go, well, why didn't they interview Senna? Or did he not approve? Or is he dead? Or You know, you'd start thinking about things which are not the story. So if you know the ending, I want you to forget and I want you to enjoy his life. And if you don't know, I don't want to ruin it for you. So that was my idea. I said, well, if we're going to have this story, Ayrton Senna has to narrate his life story. The worst thing ever would be for his greatest rival to be the key narrator 
of Senna's life in his death. Like, you know, he'd be turning in his grave. So I was like, I'm not going to do that. And that was the kind of big battle that I had. It was like, I'm not doing that. And everyone's like, you interviewed Alan Prost. I'm like, yeah. And it was a good interview. It was great. And you've not put it in a film. I'm like, no. I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, because I can't have him telling the story. Because that's what Prost did. Prost was brilliant at manipulating kind of the media and telling the story, which is why he was a genius, right? Because he could do it from his point of view. I'm like, no, somehow Senna has to narrate the story even though he's not around. So we have to find as much material of him telling you what he's feeling. And he was amazing at it. He's so eloquent in his second language. You know, he spoke so many languages, but he could do it in English and in Portuguese and then all the way through. And Formula One's one of those sports where there's journalists everywhere always recording everything before, during and after a race, every part of the weekend when they're testing everywhere. And so there he was just particularly brilliant and eloquent at expressing what was going on in his head and what he was feeling and not afraid to talk about dying or religion and all these things are kind of taboo that, you know. Mansell wouldn't have been able to talk about right but Allah, <laughs> and Allah didn't believe in necessarily and wouldn't want to give away anything away and Senna was like open he was this guy that was so Latin and amazing that very Brazilian you know very very comfortable talking about all sorts of things so yeah that's why I think we could pull it off but at the beginning we had no idea all this material existed there's one key moment actually whenever they do an interview after the race you know they do a kind of post-race interview and Prost would talk and Senna would talk and the first interview is in English and then I looked at the footage and I thought, all right, now he's doing an interview in French and he's doing one in Portuguese. Let's get the tapes. What do they say? It's going to be the same thing, isn't it? Let's, let's just get it translated. And I remember no one thinking it was worth doing. And then, you know, it's, of course, it's amazingly different. So they're literally still sitting next to each other. But after having done their kind of mm, pretty straight English interviews in French, he's basically saying, this guy's done that and this guy's that. And in Portuguese, Senna's saying, this guy, he's tried to cut me up and he's trying. And it was like, oh, right. They're like totally different stories so they're speaking to their home crowd now and so that was a key moment as well when we started digging into the archive is that when he speaks to to his audience back home in brazil he talks about god much more he didn't say that in english so much you know because it wasn't a done thing so it was all of this stuff about his spirituality that came out as we dug deeper and and it's a kind of language thing and it's also a cultural thing when he speaks to his home crowd he says one thing when he speaks in english he says something else and so that was interesting D talking of spirituality would you describe it as a, a spiritual film I really felt it you know yeah i think so I, I i'll say that's one of the reasons why the producers contacted me because my first film was a drama called the warrior um with this amazing actor irfan khan and it was a kind of spiritual journey and so I'm I'm not particularly religious now, but I've kind of grown up. My family are Muslim. I've grown up with religion. I don't have a problem with it. And I think that was a very important part of him. And they did want a filmmaker who would be comfortable expressing that side of his character. And it's very much about his spirituality and, and his comfort with God and the idea that God makes him somehow like not afraid to die is the absolute opposite of what his concept is. And it was it becomes a very strong through line, you know, this idea at the ending that he reads the Bible and not making fun of him for being religious was important. You know, that's like an absolutely normal thing and a very big part of who he was. And yeah, that that was one of the reasons I think the producers were interested in talking to me as well, because I've grown up with religion and I'm not anti kind of that concept and so yeah. yeah you don't get a lot of sports people at the time in brazil it's a big deal now every footballer is always like points to god and has a t-shirt it wasn't a dumb thing so much then you know in the 80s and 90s it wasn't like so explicit that you know all this is down to jesus or something which somehow with the way senna does it is and americans particularly it's very funny Everyone said at the time, there's absolutely no audience for this film in the US. No one knows who Ayrton Senna is. No one watches Formula One. It feels like a long time ago, yeah? No one watches Formula One. We didn't get a release originally in the US. We couldn't get distribution in the US because it's a Universal Pictures film here and we had focus features in the US and they dropped the film. They're like, no, there's no life for this film here and killed it. So we still self-released this film in America when it came out. And, uh, and what was fascinating was most of the audience, it premiered um, over there at the Sundance Film Festival. It was in unbelievable screenings because a, there was a chunk of people who'd driven across America to see it because they were big Formula One fans or they were Brazilian or they were Latin and they knew Senna and like, this could be my only chance. So they literally drove across America to go to Sundance. And there were other people who knew nothing about him, but there was a good word of mouth. And the vibe in the room, because Salt Lake City is where Sundance is, very Mormon very christian 
very religious. Bloody hell. Those screenings were like intense because they'd never heard of this guy. And they thought you can feel the audience fall in love with him. And you're like, they have no idea where this is going, do they? They genuinely didn't. And they were like absolute emotional breakdowns at the end of the film because they could not believe where the film sort of ended up. But the God, the spirituality played big in that bit. Middle America, my word. Yeah. Um, the family, Senna's family, Viviane, um, I understand a lot of work was done. Was To get the family on board, was that before you came onto the project? Mostly, yeah, mostly. Because I think I think they didn't pr approve some of the directors that James and Manish spoke to them about. And so Manish went to meet them a few times. And I think, yeah, there was a kind of, for whatever reason, they didn't get a good vibe from, from the filmmakers. And they did see my film, The Warrior. And they, I went for a meeting to San Paolo and met with them. And yeah, they seemed to like me. But, you know, it's one of those things where, they don't want me to know they've met 10 other directors and I'm like, I don't want to know you met 10 other directors. So, so yeah, there was a, it was, yeah, it was an interesting, but they were pretty, they were pretty good with us. Yeah. Did, did they, did they affect how you made the film in any way? God, I don't think so. I think, I mean, there's definitely, look, I've, I've made, after my sin, I made Amy and I did Diego Maradona and normally you're dealing with an estate. You are dealing with people who are kind of worried about the legacy of their people. But I don't think they had anything to worry about here because it's very much, it's, we're not trying to tear it and Center apart. We're huge fans. So there wasn't much that I can think of that changed because of them. The main thing that happened was the film was long. And our challenge was what length can we bring it down to? And, and so they were in Sao Paulo. We were editing in London. We didn't see them much. The young boy who's, who's driving a speedboat, that's Bruno Senna. Who becomes a Formula One driver later on? Um, so that his sister uh, um, Bianca was living in London at the time, and so occasionally she would pop in. But I don't. The parents, I don't think I met the mum and dad. You know, maybe I met the mum once. Yeah, they were pretty distant. Viviani was the person who ran the foundation, but once they saw the film, they were all on board. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just slightly conscious of time, and I wanted to get some questions out from from the audience. Um, George, we've got a roving mic, haven't we? Yeah, so um, any questions for Asif? Right, yeah. Thank you for the film. It's great. Great character. Actually, I have two questions. The first question is, why did you decide to unfold Senna's life story in a chronological way? And the second question is, how Working Title got involved in this project? Thank you. So Working Title, um, the, the producer James um, had a deal with Working Title. And so they, he off, took the film, to, the idea to them. The people who own working titles, a guy called Eric Fellner, who's like one of the kind of top guys there who runs it, the kind of chairman, who's um, super successful, you know, four weddings and a funeral. They do romantic comedies and like done loads of films I love actually. They've never made a doc before. Universal Pictures had never made a doc before. Um, but because they're super successful and super wealthy, they have a lot of nice cars and a lot of Ferraris, I think, and, and they really like their Formula One. So they've been trying to do a Formula One film for years, a drama. They did Rush after this. If you watch Rush carefully, lots of shots are rip off of this film, just saying. Um, you know, because literally I can see the shots that they take. Um, so they were interested because they like Formula One and they like the cars and like racing and they thought, yeah, this will be interesting. And they didn't know. Honestly, I think at the beginning, they all thought this would be a straight to DVD job. This would be like, you know, someone will buy a DVD at Christmas. Fine. No one thought it would be a big cinema film. But then as they watched it, everyone thought, actually, this is really a crowd pleaser and it, and it and it was a huge hit at the time it became it was the biggest british documentary of all time actually when it came out of the cinema here and what's the thing why chronologically um because of kind of what i said earlier on about at the time the convention was you would have somebody talking Ed and senna he was really fast and you'd see a car go meow yeah and then there'd be a plant there and a bookshelf and they'd say yeah i remember meeting senna once yeah he did this maneuver and then you see a little gearbox shot or something. And I'm like, fuck that, right? We're going to make you feel like you're in the moment, right? So none of that shit. We'll tell it from the beginning. So you do have this journey from when he starts out and he's a kid to the moment when he dies. So you follow his life and we pick and choose like beats of when he drives with his car, Tolman, when he has a little moment with Lotus. All of those could have been longer. Also, it's a hundred minute film. You know, now if someone does the film with Senna, it's gonna be like 15 parts and it'll be like every single thing. I'm like old fashioned. I'm like, I'll do the hard work. I'll make it short. 
everything you need to know is in that film right if you want to watch a 10 part thing i know i might not get past two or three because i'd be like i've got other stuff to do in my life so it was a conscious decision to tell it chronologically but also like i said the biggest thing was more not to reveal the ending and for him to narrate it like sunset boulevard these films where you have the characters narrating a story isn't actually around but i want you to forget while you're watching it so you want to be in the present that was the idea Hiya. Um, did you see the Schumacher film that came out a couple of years ago? I haven't seen it, no. No, okay. Um, I was going to say yeah, it, it's done slightly differently to your one because obviously there is uh, interviews with the family and, and obviously the, the thing with Schumacher at the moment is the whole element that there's a bit of mystery as towards his uh, condition and, and where the story has gone, obviously, since the end of his career. Um, I, I just sort of wondered if that sort of story did interest you and if there was ever a chance to do like a follow up. The Schumacher? Yeah, yeah. I think they did contact me. I, I know John Todd. I know I know quite a few people that were in Ferrari at the time. So I kind of had a little nudge from Jean Todd's partner. Michelle Yo, I'd done a film with before, so Mich I know Michelle, and so I did get a little message saying, "Would you be interested?" I have to be honest, I wasn't. I I have to be honest. What I like about this era is like the best car drivers in the best car racing each other. What I find terribly boring is one great driver is like, "I want a shit teammate so I can win everything." I don't see the point of that, which is what I think the most boring eras of Formula One are when we have that right now. You know, where you will have one person with all the best tech and everything. And then even when they don't win, they'll switch the rules on the last lap to make sure they win. Like, well, bollocks. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't a huge Schumacher fan, I'll be honest. Uh, and just one more question as well. Um, obviously, you've done Senna and you've done Maradona. Is there anyone else you've got an idea of for the future? Like sport? Yeah. I don't know. The, the characters kind of come and go. Um but there's not many, you know, the person, actually, you know, you, you said you did a season. The person and the film that really motivated me almost kind of subconsciously or even then eventually consciously was When We Were Kings, the Muhammad Ali film, which I remember seeing when I was a student, I think, at the Empire Lester Square. And I was a big Ali fan. So that film and the way that doc kind of played him and picked a particular moment and, and you know, that kind of rumble in the jungle section of his life was really one of the sports films and one of the characters that made me think if I make a film Senna I want it to feel like that I want to kind of like be moved by seeing Muhammad Ali in his peak and and enjoying seeing him like in the most beautiful way and also knowing I know people have tried but I'm like no actor can ever be a better Muhammad Ali than Muhammad Ali no one can be it and Senna better than Ayrton Senna no one's going to look as good as him no one's going to talk like him no one's going to have his accent and also you know drive like him so that's him driving you know it's not someone pretending so anyway that was yeah Muhammad Ali was the person I always thought in the past I haven't quite figured out yet who the next uh, there's not many that I kind of would want to spend that much time with in the same way Hi, Asif. Um, <clears throat> speaking of the three uh, docus you did, uh, Senna, Maradona, and Amy, they, the three are uh, basically at the pinnacle of the uh, career in terms of what they achieved. I mean, they're the best of the best. What, in your opinion, would you say they had in common, apart from, you know, really being good at... Uh, what they did that's my first question the second one is um you obviously um just said that you know you probably are not too keen on doing uh documentaries on uh, you know other sports uh people can i still convince you to do a docu on the zambia national team that uh, uh died off the uh, gabon uh, course, and then they ended up going back to win the Africa Cup a few years later. We'll have a sidebar chat about that <laughs> one later, yeah. on that one. Um, We've had thank it. you. Um, I have, yeah, yeah. Um, see, the problem with two questions is I then forget the first one. What, what, was the first what, one? what ties the three? Are there any common threads between Amy Senna? So, so it's a very good question. I'm sure there is, right? Um, 
one thing is they're kind of all child stars. They're all amazing when they were young, and and that brings its own pressure. I would say what, what okay when I they were never meant to be a trilogy, but they sort of became a trilogy. Senna is the kind of upper class character. He's from wealth. He's in Formula One. He comes from like it's such an elite sport. And he was born with money and he had money and he was like living in the world of mega money, which is Formula One. Amy's sort of middle class. She sings jazz. She's from Southgate. She can move to Camden, but she's like middle class character. And then Maradona's from the street. So he's like the working class guy. He's football. And he's like, it's the poor person's sport. So I always kind of thought of them as this idea of like, they're kind of similar in terms of, they're not the... Senna's not, you know, didn't win the most world championships, hasn't won the most races. You know, Amy's not the biggest selling artist of all time. And Maradona, you know, hasn't won as many trophies as other people. So it was always not about them being like the best um, in terms of numbers and stats, but actually character. And generally, they're kind of fighting the establishment. That's one of the themes that I'm interested in is people who are fighting. Even if you are powerful, you're still fighting the system. And so Senna's fighting Balest and fighting like what he felt was corruption. Amy kind of fighting like the press and the media and the attacks on who she was and what happened to her and her own kind of personal demons. And Maradona was just fighting everyone, right? Including himself. If he's bored, he'd have a fight in a paper bag. So, so that idea of having someone to fight against gives you some drama and that gives you something to show that's where a movie comes from people who are just lovely and nice and great are really boring i think you know for me to make a movie about it. like they're great i'm sure they've loads of fans and all that and people will watch it but dramatically they don't have much for me to kind of interest me and i think that's maybe what it is is they they were all fighters in their own kind of universe and she was very much amy's a woman as a woman being attacked in a way that men, men maybe would not have been attacked. So, but that's what it was. I remember thinking there was something about that. The first two, very sadly, die young. Senna and Amy died very young. Um, so I thought if I do a third film, I can't have that same story. So Maradona, the idea was he was alive when I, I met him. I interviewed him. So I was like, okay, this time I want to make a film about someone who's around and alive, who's really tricky, very difficult character. And, I, and he's had a very long life. Um, and I have to figure out how to do that because when you have a person who died at 27 or 34, you know, and you have a definite ending, you know there's a kind of emotional arc. If you have Maradona, it's like absolute chaos every day of his life. And by the time you meet him, he'll have done something else tomorrow and it's like your film's out of date. So that the challenge was how do you frame it? So with that one, we, po we picked the section which I thought was the most pivotal, which is Napoli when he was in Italy, which is the least well-known, and then to frame it around a section of his life. So that's the thing. The other, the other thing that I suppose is worth mentioning is with each of the films, each of them being entirely made out of archive, you have a character, you have their journey, their story, but I'm always thinking, how do I show this in a cinematic way? And so we knew we had material that showed the period of Napoli for Diego Maradona. We, we found amazing kind of personal footage with Amy and with... Senna, it was like, okay, Formula One is the most filmed sport at the time. So there's a way to make the cinematic and cut it like a fiction film. Like the sequence when he wins in Brazil is one of my favourite sections when he says to his dad, touch me gently. You know, that sequence, if you did that in a, in a movie, like the crowd that you've got, you've got helicopters, you've got, uh, you know, a, a, however many hundred thousand people, then you have him winning and then it rains and then he can't get out of the car and you've got, and it's just like so dramatic. And that's like one scene. Now in other, with other stories, other characters, if you couldn't show that, it'd just be somebody telling you about a moment when he, cr he drove and he couldn't get out of the car. And it's like, there's no drama in that. You have to be able to show it. So each film, we end up sometimes changing the story not for what is the most famous moment in their life that may have been written about in lots of books, but, but what can we show? What's the visual scene that tells a story about a character, not necessarily what's been written about by everyone? That's the key thing. Also, these are three, three characters that sort of transcended the world that they were in. Yeah. They, they, I mean, I, I sometimes wonder if it's a sort of Icarus theme running through them. Have you, have you ever thought of that? Do you know, it's one of the things you kind of make the film and then I was like, whatever you feel, yeah, because I... I I, I I kind of made them as separate movies, but they're not made with the intention to kind of, they, they're, yeah, but Icarus is another one thing. They're, they're about fame. They're about the pressure of fame and, and, you know, what can happen. 
and the sort of destructiveness of it absolutely but there's different arcs you know, yeah i mean senna was very much like his journey is on an upward curve and then there's an accident you know amy's is very much the highs and lows of like her becoming successful and famous and then what happens when you get famous and how people treat you and the fall is as long as the rise and maradona's like i always think of like his is like a circle he just goes round and say he just goes round and round. He goes somewhere. Everyone loves him. He's great. He's the king of the world. He hates someone. He starts fighting. They hate him. They want to get rid of him. He goes. He goes somewhere. Else. He says, he's great. We've got Maradona. He's fantastic. Oh, okay, yeah. He starts arguing. He fights everyone. He goes. And his was like this repetition, this scratch record. And he never looks back. He never looks back. Senna's always looking back and thinking and planning and strategizing. You know, he's really. You can see it's all being worked out. There's very different brains going on. Hmm. Um, one right here and then another one there. Thank you, yeah. Bloody hell. <laughs> that would have been dramatic. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, thank you for this beautiful portrait. And I'm still trying to understand what kind of portrait it is. And there is this one little moment in the film um, that maybe you don't even know the answer to. But maybe, maybe you do. Uh, so when Senna was uh, already with Williams, and uh, and Sid um, told him, retire, and I will retire, and we'll go fishing. And Senna said that he can't. But do you know why he said that? I think that's kind of his character. He's not a quitter. He never gives up. That was part of his. That was his fatal flaw. He would never walk away from a fight or something. He's like, I've got to. I've got to challenge this. So that's the wine of Donnelly sequence is important where we would all walk away and him that final race, anyone else would be like, I'm not going to race today. His whole thing is whenever I have that fear or whenever I worry, I get in the car and I drive him faster. And that was his character. And so I think that's the thing. He was never the, a quitter in life in any form. That, that just seemed his way of being. Anyone else would not have driven. He had to. Were there any contractual obligations? I don't think as a contractual you know thing, no. I'm sure there were sponsors thing, but I don't think any I mean the bigger thing is shouldn't the race should have been cancelled. People dying on track. They should have cancelled a race. Two people died that weekend and they carried on racing. It's mad. You know. Um you know, there there was a I tell you what the contractual bit was, because Ratzenberger, Roland Ratzenberger died during qualifying. Senna died in the race but they didn't announce that he'd died and that way he could fly off and they say he was still alive so they could keep racing because that's why it's kind of there's lots of things Sid says he knew then that all the signs were that you know he wasn't going to survive and he felt him sigh and his soul um, as someone who doesn't believe in God his soul kind of goes and leaves his body spirit leaves his body and so he knew and they knew that he was dead but they didn't announce it and the race carried on and Schumacher actually won that race and celebrated. Uh, so it was a weird thing, but he did it because he had to. That's his weakness in a way, if there's such a thing as that. But he was never going to give up the fight, I think. Thank you. And, you know, Schumacher's car was illegal. <laughs> it had it had traction control on it. Everyone on that Benetton team at some point got banned for some form of cheating. Yeah, over there. Uh, the one in the middle and then one here. And I can't see the back very clearly, so if there's anyone there. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's any pieces I of art. By the way, just going to say, on Sorry. the way here, it was Senna Weather, wasn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wonder if there's any pieces of archive you could tell us about that you weren't able to use for any reason that were really really good in a one that got away kind of way the, the one that uh, i this a tiny bit of it at the end of the film in the titles where senna was just like not like any other driver there's a particular accident that he sees when he's qualifying and it's in the end credits and he gets out of his car and he runs to the driver and holds his helmet to make sure he doesn't swallow his tongue and that's because Senna and Sid were such good mates that he would like ask him like if I saw an accident what should I do and that's what he did he did and he got there before the ambulance 
I can't think of anyone else who would do that on a Formula One track, like jump out of the car while cars are whizzing by, run along the track to go and help someone who's injured. So that's the scene that I always think, why isn't that in the film? Um, and, you know, there was a point when the film, this is a mad thing, this, there was a five hour cut of Senna. It was, I thought it was great. No one else, I, don't know. I thought it was good. And then there was a three hour cut. And then we had to, they were like, there's no way we're gonna let you release a long film like this, okay? So then there was a really good two hour cut and then the film's 100 minutes, so we had to lose 20 minutes. And I think that seed came out in that hardcore, we've got to take 20 minutes out of this film to just tighten it up. And, it, I mean, it's a tighter film, and it's a better film, but there were some really good scenes. And that's the one that stands out to me of, you know, literally, Sid said, you know, could well have helped save him from having any injuries by jumping out and being there quickly to make sure, um, you know, he didn't have any damage. I'm sure there's other stuff. I'll, I'll think about it. There's one here. And then there. There's one closer here. I yeah, think okay. Yeah, do that one and then we, we go, go here first because you're next to the mic. Okay. Did, you, did you hold your hand? Was there a hand there? Yeah, okay. that's right. And then we'll move forward. Yeah. Um, how did the music for the film come about and how did you manage to match it to the footage? So... I'm glad you asked that. I, I love the music. So the music's by Antonio Pinto, this amazing composer, Brazilian composer, who who um, did City of God and Central Station, and he's worked with Michael Mann. And he, he, this is a mad story. He heard that we were making a film about Senna. He lives in Sao Paulo, he's Brazilian. He contacted me and he said, I hear you're making a film about Senna. I was like, yeah, he goes, I love Senna. I've got to do the music. I'm like, oh, right? <laughs> Um, I don't think we can afford you, you know. This is like a quite low-budget kind of film that we were just tinkling around with still. And he's like, no, I've got to do it. Now, I've done this on my other films where before before I've made a film, I've kind of asked the composer to create the music. And so this is my first doc. So I'm like, okay, Antonio, I don't know one whether I can kind of get you on this film. I'm not allowed to send out any footage because it's universal and working title. So can you write some music just from your memories of Ayrton Senna? So the main theme that you hear when he wins in Brazil and at the end of the film, Antonio wrote that from his memories of watching Senna and going to the track. So the kind of one that makes me cry is him writing about Senna and what he felt as a Brazilian. And, and then I took the music that he wrote and we just started placing it in the film. And then what often you do with composers is that they may have other music that they've made and you kind of test it out. What I don't like to do is like go to my record collection and put music in and, and fall in love with something and then say to a composer, can you copy that? So I don't like, that's called temp music. I don't really like temp music. So I always like to have my composer create the music. So he creates all the score and all the soundtrack. Um, and then um, there's one particular scene well, the, the scene where he dies, when he crashes, right? That is a song from a film that he could Behind the Sun by Walter Salas. It's a piece of music from Behind the Sun, which I loved. And I did place that. And that was one of the pieces of music where he said, OK, it's so perfect for that scene. I'll make sure you can use it. There's a couple of other little bits. You know, in that there's an amazing shot where he first is revealed to be in the Lotus and all the other cars sort of pull away and revealing this beautiful JPS Lotus that music i think that's from a michael mann film so we had to get michael mann to give us permission to use it or something so it was a lot of kind of pulling favors and stuff but people who loved senna and michael mann's a big senna fan he's just done his formula one film i think he did film for ferrari um that's kind of how it came about so antonio eventually yeah would watch the cut and do music but that main theme is is very much him writing from the heart of his memories of of ayrton and and I'm watching him at the track in in Sao Paulo and writing about that. Thank you. And there was then there was one here. And, and the that, editor and Chris is a brilliant editor with music. So a lot of that, the pacing and the timing and all that, that's all just great editing. Chris King. Hi. Did you see this week that clip about if you don't go for a gap, you're not a racing driver? Lewis Hamilton quoted that this yeah. week. If you saw that, but my question was, it's a great quote. Yeah, exactly. Stuart, yeah. you should know this. <laughs> But as a film, three times world champion, yeah. that you you should know. You had a story. Toy said you have a story and look for clips to support the story, or look at clips and then say build a story from the clips because there must have been a huge. You said it, a huge volume. 
and a lot of it was not in English. So you, yeah, have... yeah. I would say um, my brain works the other way. I look at the material and then think about the story, and that's where Manish was key. He knew the story, so he would say, "This is really important," or "This is really important," and we were like, "Okay, well, well how do we show that?" And then it was this kind of triangle between the editor, the writer, myself, and us trying to find the right, right way to make this feel cinematic and to work for people who are Formula One fans, but also not. Like, you know, there's, there's like, manish, uh, let me just explain the shot. Sometimes I'd like take a shot from one place and I'd just say, oh, no, no, no. It's a close up of his eyes and I'll just cut it into another race. And Manish, go, what have you done? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, it's the wrong helmet. I'm like, it's like a close up like that. He's like, I can see the inside of the helmet, it's green. And it wasn't green that year, it was blue or something. And I'm like, oh, Christ. no one's gonna, because everyone will know, everyone will know, and a film will like fail. So, oh, right so like he was a bit like that like he would know the inside of the cut the fucking furry bit inside a helmet he was like everyone's looking at that so that was like his obsession but it was amazing to have someone like that because there was so much material to just stop me just doing whatever the hell i wanted to do or the editor wanted to do but then i would push back and that was the fun part of it was because there's so much material and because you know formula one is all about pushing technology and one of the technologies that formula one's pushing was cameras they got smaller and smaller and smaller so they could put them, you know, in vehicles and drive that fast and they weigh nothing. And so they're like way ahead of any other technology. So the film, kind of going back to your point, it starts off looking pretty ropey because it actually starts off almost on film. The very first footage is almost shot on film and very, very kind of poor quality video. And then as it goes through, it looks better and better and better because the technology and the cameras that Formula One use get better and better. They have more and more cameras. And um, so the film is not just about him growing up and the cars changing and the steering wheels changing from being round wheels to being, you know, with all the buttons that they have now. But also the technology that we're showing you the film changes with it. And I thought I always find that kind of an interesting thing of how things develop and progress. Um, there was something else, but I forgot. Yeah. In the Monaco GP, the in, in car shots, yeah. were they taken from a different year? Maybe. I think... No, was it a different... Yeah, maybe one of them. One of them, there wasn't... The, no, the one lap where he talks about having an out-of-body experience is the one where there wasn't a camera in his car that year. So sometimes you're like, okay, we're making a film. I've got to tell you the story. It's still him driving around Monaco. I can't remember if it was the other... I can't remember now. I, I only knew because I think I'd read that. And yeah. managed... There's a, I, I didn't there's a load of... There's a, oh, my God. I used to have a stalker at one point. He was like... <laughs> You use a shot which is from the wrong race, and I'm gonna come and find you. I'm like, Fuck. So he was like, I know you're going to Brighton on Tuesday, and I'm gonna be there. So I've had a few like nutters like that. You see. You're not in today, are you? you might be, yeah. <laughs> that, then, it does look like, yeah, no. <laughs> not him, are you? I'm not no. him. No. <laughs> um, we had one at, at the back, didn't we? Hello. Um, I almost hate to go back to the um, comparing the three films, um, Amy and Maradona and now Senna, um, but I, I can't help but ignore the fact that the three of them seem like martyrs of some kind, uh, uh, sacri quite sacrificial kind of characters, um, each kind of representing a certain audience. Um, two of them strike me as being slightly more divisive and flawed as individuals than the other two. Um, Senna seems remarkably um, uh, uh, angelic compared to the other two characters. I, I wonder if you were to redo the film, would you reevaluate some of the maybe more... Did you discover anything that you found flawed about him in any way? Did you... Did you find anything in your within your research i mean i say it i mean apart from he yeah. crashes into prost at about 200 miles per hour on purpose <laughs> i mean and could have killed both of them at, to win the championship because he was so pissed off i mean that's pretty tight you know that's like mad um and that's in there i don't know was there more stuff about him i think i think it is genuinely the character i of all the people because i interview a lot of people i may not put the interviews in I would say, from my research and interviews, that's a fair representation of Ayrton Senna. And of the per of all the people I spoke to, because I didn't meet him and I didn't meet Amy, um, there definitely would be people that didn't like him, but I wouldn't say that the film is like, 
not representing him properly for me okay i'm sure there's other people that didn't like him but i think that is a we like i said we had to put we had to pick and choose what we what we say um you know for example i was look at when i see the film and i see the first kind of opening whatever it is 15 20 minutes i think 20 minutes in he wins his third world championship a lot of films that would be the end of their film that would be like and then he became world champion yeah and it's like, that's not, like a, not even the first act. He's not even, you know, he's only just getting going with Prost. So we whiz through a lot. Um, Amy is kind of challenging and difficult in a way. And, you know, yeah, I'm sure there could be a much, much kind of tougher character. Maradona absolutely was a very, very difficult character. And funnily enough, it's funny now, you've sort of touched something. What do they have in common? I would say none of the three were loved before we made the film. There wasn't this universal love for Ayrton Senna before we made the film, particularly in this country, because everyone liked the British drivers. And, you know, there were other people that were kind of more powerful with their PR. Um, Amy was absolutely not lo universally loved before we made that film. Lots of people just thought she was a joke and made fun of her. And Maradona was hated because of, like, the handball against England. So uh, if there was something that I was interested in, was I liked that battle. I'm saying, let me start with people that are not loved and then tell you their story. And then you decide at the ending what you feel for them. But I'm going to tell you from their point of view of what it's like to be them. That was that was a part of it. Starting with people that are great, that everyone loves and thinks are fantastic and they're really nice. There's nowhere to go with that, I would say. Is there um, one of the three that you identify with most as a character? Personally. Amy's the one that I, like, I felt like I could have grown up next door to. You know, she's a North London girl. And I lived around that part of the world for quite a long time. And she's the one that I would say is the most, like, the closest to, uh, you know, a Brazilian racing driver is like from another planet. And and I've been to Via Forita where Maradona's from and his lifetime, his existence, not my lifestyle, my existence. So I would say if, if any of them, it's the one in the middle. Yeah, Amy, probably. Were there any more questions in the back? I just can't see any hands. Okay. Oh, one more in the front. Okay. Yeah, and then you've got a train in 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, one thing I think I thought uh, was wrong with the film was that it was too short. And I'd really like to see the long Let's cuts. do the five-hour cut together. Yeah, well, you know, could you release it on DVD, maybe? Do you know, the, the, uh, the problem with the longer versions, and I've had lots of people over the years wanting to see more, and actually there is more kind of complicated stuff in the longer version, obviously. But... It's really expensive getting the access and clearing sports footage and Formula One footage, you know. And so any film like that, opening it up, much as people want to and people have asked and loads of people over the years have said it, it's like someone has to pay for it. And the people who own that, the film, they don't care about paying to reopen a film to clear all of the other footage. And I don't even know who owns the archive now. Is it the new guys? Is it still Bernie? Who knows? People, you know, are not around anymore. So it becomes very difficult to do that. Maybe when you get a lifetime achievement award, <laughs> they will do release it. I mean, I, I kept thinking, yeah, I kept thinking I could on the quiet kind of, can I just show it on like, I've got all the DVDs at home, don't tell anyone. And uh, I did do a thing at a festival, which is a bit of a safer way, because if you sell tickets, then you have to have clearance to actually show what, what you're selling a ticket for. So I did do an event at the Sheffield Dock Fest Festival with the editor we showed the the whole point was to show clips that were never in the film and we did a bit of it there that was kind of fun you know i just remembered another clip that was really powerful when he went to lotus senna had bell's palsy so it was like it looked like he was paralyzed just before he went from tolman to lotus and there was a lot of footage where you know he could have kind of lost his sight and he was really worried and again sid watkins was the person who gave him the right antibiotics and so that footage was quite shocking when you saw him because his whole face was kind of like light he'd had a stroke um and that, and there's one shot where he wins i think when he wins an esther or when he wins with with um the lotus guy in the rain and his face doesn't quite look right and when i see that i'm like oh right Mo most people won't notice it but that there was a bunch of shots that i remember a sequence that was like that which again got cut okay so li listen As asif has taken a train down from from ipswich just to be here tonight and he's going to take a train back. I want to let now. you down. So um, I think I speak for everyone here. Thank you so much for your time and Thanks for the well. film and uh, we really hope to have you again. Um, I'll be back. Let's do it again. Terrific. Thank you everyone.